Well, hi, Sax Gourmet fans. It's Tuesday night, so it must be time for another one of our saxophone videos, uh, here, video sessions here uh, from Facebook Live here from the uh, Ultra Top Secret Command and Control Bunker at Sax Gourmet World Headquarters uh, located in Sector R of the Birthplace of Jazz uh, in the city of New Orleans. And uh, I hope everybody had a great holiday. I got to see my brothers and my cousins and my nieces and my nephews. And most importantly, I got to see two of my grandsons and I'm very proud of them. Now, I want to give a very special, special shout out to a couple of guys I've been thinking about lately. And that's Tyler, Alex, and Jack. <laughs> I'm sorry that petition thing didn't work out for you. But I want you to know a couple of things. First, I'm thinking about you. I am thinking about you. And I hope the three of you all learn how to pee standing up sometime soon. Sorry, we lost our connection there for a minute, uh, but those guys get the message. Okay, so tonight what we're going to talk about, sorry about the connection, I can't control that. Must be phase of the moon or planetary alignment, something like that. What we're going to talk about tonight is, is it me or is it the horn? And uh, hello there, Bernard Jean from Canada. Uh, Casey Ray, I love you, you know I do, and my brother Dave. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is how to do a little diagnos diagnosis of the situation and see, is it you or is it the horn? Now, the first thing you got to do, you got to do this, and don't go any further till you do this, you got to make sure that your saxophone is absolutely, positively, completely Leap free. Hello, Donna. I love you, and you know I do. Um, by the way, Donna's going. Donna, Donna Schwartz is going to have a great seminar over on her site. Uh, following this, I think she starts at around uh, six o'clock uh, Pacific time. So, Buck Baker. I, oh, Buck Baker. I love you, Buck. All right. So, if your horn is not leak free, don't go any further. Hollywood Swanger. Now, here's a couple of ways to check for leaks. Uh, of course, the obvious way is to check it with a leak light, but almost nobody, including most of the repairmen, have a clue how to really use a leak light. Um, it is so important when you're checking for leaks that you don't try to muscle them down with your fingers. It's got to be absolutely no pressure. As a matter of fact, when we overhaul a horn, something we try to do is this. We take the springs off, and then we, we have it on a, a, a work fixture, and then we just let the pads sit down by themselves under gravity alone. Joe Albano is a wild, is a wild man, and you know that. But at any rate, um, you got to get yourself, uh, I, I don't know why we're having all these problems, but we are. Um, I know I paid my internet bill, so, uh, can't be me, but, uh, anyway, you got to get yourself a leak light, okay? Now, the ones, I, I use two different types, and I'll tell you where I got them. Uh, the one I use 90% of the time is an LED leak light. They sell it at musicmedic.com, uh, as the Nova leak light. And those of you that have been here uh, to visit my repair shop know that we have a couple of big, bright, fluorescent leak lights. We've, we've got two uh, saxophone repair fixtures. One of them is upright, one of them is horizontal. But we've got a fluorescent leak light that's plenty bright. But I'm, I'm telling you, those LED lights that you can get now, particularly the Nova leak light, they'll send your retinas. They are so bright, and that's what you need. You need a bright, okay, you need a bright light and an absolutely dark room, or you're not going to find all the lights. 
uh, all, all the leaks. Now you find the light. It's easy in a dark room with a bright light, but uh, you got to find those leaks. And uh, another thing that I used to take with me everywhere, uh, kept in my case, uh, is I had a, a what we call a rope type light. Uh, it's got LEDs in it and a little plastic cover. And you can you can uh, you know curl it up, put it in your saxophone case. And I believe that Music Medic still sells those. Over the years, I've experimented with uh, different colors of leak lights, and I found that kind of a orange worked well for me, and also leak lights that would uh, blink. Yeah, that was cool. Um, the uh, colors, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the connection. I can't help. I can't control that. But the, the colored leak lights help me. I'm legally blind, and so everything looks, well, this is just a mess. I'm sorry. All right, now here's another thing. If you don't want to use electricity and you're one of those back-to-earth tree hugger types, uh, and how can you check your saxophone for leaks? It's easy. Take the mouthpiece off the horn. Take a Johnny Evans. He's a rock star. I want you to know Johnny Evans is a real rock star. He plays with Kid Rock, uh, among many other people, but Johnny Evans is a real rock star. Uh, but you, you take your horn, take the mouthpiece off, finger low B flat, and put an ordinary plastic coffee can lid over the bell. Then suck all the air out of it, and then take your fingers off. If the keys stay down, leak free. Keys don't stay down, you need to do some more work. Okay. Part of the secret to keeping your horn leak-free is to be sure that your pads are still supple and, and flexible uh, and all that. And there are a couple of um, treatments that you can get. Uh, if you've got older pads in your horn, uh, you, you, need to, to, you can restore a lot of suppleness. Uh, we, we make one. It's Steve's Voodoo Pad Treatment. Hello, Betty Lou. And one of my old girlfriends there. She's still a good-looking girl, too. Uh, but anyway, um, but you, you can get, get this and, and, and paint your pads with it, and it'll restore a lot of that flexibility. Uh, you want to be sure if you're using any kind of pad treatment on your pads, don't allow any pad treatment that has silicone near your near your horn because that'll make your pads sticky and you hear that um, every time you, you raise a key. So be sure that the pad treatment that you're using is silicone free. Uh, now it's also important if you want to keep your pads uh, where they're sealing just right is that um, you, want to, you want to be sure that the pads are good and clean. Now let me tell you something. Don't you Quit reading sacks on the web and, and don't use lighter fluid or naphtha, as it's correctly called, to clean your pads off. Because why? Because it will dry out the leather. You wouldn't use lighter fluid on an expensive pair of leather shoes, would you? Of course not. Well, don't use them on your saxophone pads. Uh, also, you want to be sure to clean those pads off real well. And if you're using one of those fuzzy shove it type uh, swabs, you know, make sure it's not shedding fibers and they get on your pads and they cause little leaks. The best thing to use in cleaning your pads, take the keys off the horn and clean the pads carefully with saddle soap. There's nothing better. It nourishes the leather. And then if you've got older pads, put some treatment on there. Now, we want to be sure before we get into all this stuff of diagnosing playing problems, it got to be leak free. Remember that it's got to be absolutely leak free. And uh, something that I do every now and then, uh, every couple of months, is I go through. Joe, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. Uh, everything that I do uh, is is I go in there and with a heat gun. And now I use a Vortex Air Torch from uh, Music Medic, but I go in there and I, I, I uh, wedge all the, the keys down. Hmm, during that little intermission. Uh, he, here's the kind of wedges we use. You can see these little wo wooden wedges. I buy them a hundred at a time from a free tool. And I also, in some places, use these little square 
corks, uh, but I get everything down there not not cranked down, but with uh, you, you know just enough pressure to close the pad, and then I'll reheat it. Arnold Montgomery he makes great mouthpieces, but uh, reheat it all and, and let my pads kind of re reset. And, and when I do that, I'll spritz them with a little uh, little water as well. Uh, Joe to answer, uh, yeah, it was Joe to answer the question. Old English works okay. Um, hmm, I'm not sure what all's in that stuff, Joe. So uh, I just don't know. Get yourself some of our voodoo pad juice, and if you'll do that, I'll throw in a bottle of key oil. Order you some now. Uh, but anyway, uh, another thing that'll help keep your pads um, uh, where they ought to be all the time, and I keep telling you knuckleheads about this, is get yourself... Yeah, I got some over here I'm going to show you. Get yourself some key clamps and use them. Whenever your horn's not being played, you ought to have it in clamps because the pads are going to blow it out uh, unevenly due to changes in temperature, humidity, phase of the moon, planetary alignment, who knows what all. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, tag Jimmy Obar. You better believe it. He's an old friend of mine. Uh, Keith Esposito's with us too. But anyway, key clamps. And when your horn's being moved, you know, those keys flapping around, and just in the case, keys flapping around, is that a good idea? Do you really? Of course you don't think so. You smarter than that. So get yourself some key clamps and uh, get the right kind. All right. Now, I'm sorry about this crappy connection. I just don't know what to do about it. But at any rate, uh, another thing you need to do once a month is take a good look at everything on your horn and make sure all the corks and felts haven't unduly compressed and not doing their job, or even worse, are missing. And if so, you need to replace them. Now, if you're going to replace uh, felts or corks on your horn, uh, the material that I recommend you use is the best quality felt you can get. Uh, because the good woven felt like they use on pool tables uh, is great and it doesn't excessively compress. And if you go to a place that recovers pool tables uh, and ask them for just some scraps, you'll have a lifetime supply. Uh, that stuff is great. And here's another little tip. Once you get it on the horn there, and, and you can get it different thicknesses, but uh, get it on there, put a drop of water there where the, where the key touches the felt and then heat it and it'll it'll burn a seat in there and it won't compress any further uh, at the bottom of your keys instead of using felts or corks you know where they contact the body get yourself some sorbethane sorbethane is great you can buy sorbethane from uh, music music medic hello rick all right now let's get how to figure out what in the world is wrong with our home now Frank. Hello, Frank. Frank brings me a jug of good liquor every time he comes to see me, and I want you to know it's appreciated, and Frank knows good liquor. All right. Now, here's the number one thing I find wrong with horns. Guy comes in to see me, and he says, uh, hey, Steve, uh, my horn won't play the low notes. Okay. Here's the, here's the easy diagnosis for that. Play low C, and then Add, after you get a good low C going, add the low C sharp key. Ooh, that connection, I don't know. But anyway, if then the note begins to break up, doesn't get a good sound, here's what your problem is. And I just happen to have a saxophone right here beside me so I can show you guys how to do this. All right, if you look right here, there's two adjusting screws in any modern saxophone has that on there, okay? One of these screws controls, let me get up here, yeah. You see this, see that one? On the lower one, that's controlling the one and one B flat. But the other one controls whether the G sharp key comes up when you play in G sharp, low C sharp, low B, a low C, uh, B flat. And you don't want that to happen. So, um. What you got to do is you got to very, with a light pressure, turn that, turn that screw just a little bit at a time, play test it, check it with your light, 
and make sure that's good and tight. Uh, that's uh, an adjusted bridge, and it's so important. Now, uh, on a lot of horns, uh, certainly all the ones we manufacture, and, and most of the good stuff today, they've got adjusting screws on the upper and lower main stacks. And uh, once a month, you ought to go in there and, uh, yeah, you, you're so right, Joe. Uh, but anyway, go once a month, get a little screwdriver, go through that. All right, now the next thing, guy comes in and says, Steve, my horn doesn't play the low notes. No, do I, am I, I can't get the low notes out. Well, knucklehead, here's a couple things you got to do. You got to make sure that your neck, where the neck goes into the body, and I'm going to take advantage of that momentary interruption. I'm going to show you how to check that. All right, we got we got a neck in here. Now, you don't want to have the screw run cranked down excessively tight to do this. But what I want to do is I want to rotate the neck around here, around like this. And I want to see, does it grab in any one place? Is the, is the resistance the same all the way around? If it isn't, then your neck or your receiver or both are not round. And if it's not terribly, what you can do is you can uh, uh, take a little toothpaste, a little bit of oil, get in there and lap it out to a perfect roundness. Now, if it's got to be expanded when you go to the repair shop because you ain't got the tool that does this, make sure that the repairman's got that tool looks like an old-fashioned crank can opener. And you got to have three expansions on the neck to do it right. The first expansion is in the middle of the tenon. The next expansion is at the top. And by the way, every time you expand, you know, test it, make sure it's fitting and you hadn't overexpanded it. And then the third one will be at the bottom. The receiver's got to be round. Okay. Now, the number one complaint that all repairmen get is Steve, my horn doesn't play in tune. I can't use this mouthpiece with it, Steve. What's the matter? I'm not worthy. Something's wrong with me. I don't know. Okay. Here's a couple of things you need to know. And, and I, you go read on Saxo, and they're going to say, well, <laughs> all you got to do is adjust your key heights, and that's going to set the pitch. Are you kidding me? All right, look. In this universe, the laws of physics dictate that anything in excess of 30% uh, uh, of the diameter of the tone hole doesn't make any difference. So maybe that's about the right height for you to have it open. Yeah. Now, if you start lowering it below that, you're going to find that, yes, the pitch does get flat, but you're also going to find that the voice of the note goes away. And we don't want that. So uh, I, I think trying to control intonation uh, via key heights is a fool's game. It's a fool's game. Um, if that's a problem, it, you know, intonation on a certain note is a problem, well, there are a couple other things we ought to check out. All right, now, now look, here's the reality. Like it or not, old does not mean better. Okay? So if you're playing a saxophone made before about 1975, 1976, it's going to come with some baggage, and that baggage is not everything on it. It's going to play in tune, so you don't have to do something about it. Um, and don't tell me, oh, I just love the old sound. You can't duplicate that. Are you kidding me? I am not stupid. You can duplicate anything. Did you hear me? You can duplicate anything. And don't tell me you can't because I do it all the time. Um, we just try to make things better. I, I don't want to make a, you know, a 10 m tenor and say that's the greatest tenor in the world i can make a better tenor than that i do make a better tenor than that and so do a number of other companies now one thing you got to check out and, and it is true that some mouthpieces will not work on some horns so what you got to do is uh you, you know if, if we straighten out the neck it's a cone or it's pretty much cone but it, it's it's a truncated cone ends round instead of being pointed, but we could calculate that missing portion. 
and we could calculate the volume of that missing portion, write that number down, then measure the volume of your uh, tone chamber of your mouthpiece. We do that by pouring water in them. You gotta block them off. And the farther apart, and write that number down, and the farther apart those two numbers get, hello, Dale, uh, the farther apart those two numbers get, the worse that mouthpiece is gonna work on that horn. Uh, another question that came up recently was, uh, Steve, I'm thinking about putting an extension on my neck uh, so I can use a certain mouthpiece. Okay. If you can convince me that you can do that and, and the problem is just that your mouthpiece wobbles on the end, don't put it on the neck. Don't do that. Don't put it on the shank of the mouthpiece. Okay? Just add it on there. And that, that'll stabilize it, okay? At that point where the cork is, the neck is cylindrical rather than conical, and it's not going to have a great impact on the pitch. Um, so don't you dare cut your neck off too short. Uh, but, yeah, you can put a, an extension on the shank and stabilize that. And then these guys that come in here saying, uh, well, Steve, I can't play in tune. Uh, one of the first questions I ask them is this. Uh, would you mind telling me what notes you use to tune up with? Well, sure, Steve, I use concert B-flat. Really? Okay, here's why that's a bad idea. That, that would be a G on the alto and the baritone, and a uh, concert B-flat would be C on the soprano and the tenor and the bass. Uh, but... The, the, the reason is, uh, with, without sparing you the three-hour uh, lecture in physics and cross-venting and stuff like that, it, it, those are bad choices. Uh, the reason you play concert B-flat is because when you were in a in, in little, little school band, the band director had the whole band play concert B-flat. And uh, concert B-flat, mm, it was. And hell, you, you had 100 kids in the room, you couldn't tell anything. But if you're playing just by yourself with your tuner, here's two notes I want you to use. And these are the saxophone notes, not the concert pitches. I want you to use F sharp, and I want you to use one finger B. Don't use low B. Now, once you've got an F sharp going on, and then you've got a B going on, and they're in tune to your satisfaction, your, your work's not through. Here's what you got to do. You got to then press that octave key and go up an octave. Now, I want to tell you something. As you guys know, I make a living designing and manufacturing saxophones. And I want to tell you that it's quite easy to design a saxophone that plays in tune with itself in the lower octave. Nothing to it. But getting those octaves to match, that's the trick. And uh, so... To get the F sharp and then the F sharp with the octave and the B and the B with the octave to match is your job and is not a perfect world. What do you mean which F sharp? One, two, three, one. That F sharp. Um, so what you have to do is, is, is like life. It's like married life. It's full of compromises. So, so, so you got to Move it back and forth on the cork until you're getting a consistent note, you know, or something you can live with on, on, on both of them. Okay. And uh, then they say, well, well, maybe if I'll try a different read, I can play in tune. Are you kidding me? I want to tell you something, boys and girls. The read that you use doesn't have a damn thing to do with the pitch. Nothing. Zero. Nah, nah. Now, it may have something to do with how your body interacts with the horn and ultimately uh, you know, affects the pitch. But as far as the read itself determining pitch, are you kidding me? Quit reading sax on the web. Um, the, another thing about the response, not the, not the pitch, but the response that the read uh, will influence. Let's, let's see if we can look at this sideways. Yeah, if you look at this, you see that there's a point right about there where the reed is tangent to the side rails. 
and I want this reed when I blow it to wrap itself around the facing curve, see, and seal up here so we get that nice pop. Okay, the profile of the reed has got to match the facing curve of your mouthpiece. And if you look at different brands of reeds, uh, you look at uh, Van Doren, a Rico, a Hempke, a Lavos, a Gonzalez, or a, uh, uh, this this one happens to be a, a Fiber Cell Premier. Um, all of these, uh, Jason Mingledorf. Now there's a rock star. There is a real rock star. But at any rate, your reeds kind of match your mouthpiece. Okay, so. What you got to do is you might find some different brands, some working better than others on your particular mouthpiece, or uh, ruin about a thousand reeds like I did and learn how to adjust them very carefully. Recently, I acquired this tool called the um, Reed Geek, and it changed my world as far as adjusting my cane reeds and all that. It is magnificent. Um, and it, it may, you can do a really good job. So, at, at any rate, I apologize again for this lousy internet connection. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, so, that, that's something you can do. Now, sometimes guys come in here and say, boy, I love the way the reed plays, but I can't get the low notes out. Then what we do is we, we'll drill a hole, not all the way through it, but we'll uh, drill a hole right about here on the vamp. And we'll go down about a sixteenth of an inch, and we'll drill one or so about a half an inch in diameter, and down about a sixteenth. Don't you drill all the way through it, because then the reed won't play. But if you do that, you'd be amazed at how much better that the uh, reed will play. Now, we publish uh, all the time charts showing you how to adjust your reeds, where to take material off to make them play better. And remember this. Once the material is off, you can't put it back on. Okay, now here is the most important thing I'm going to show you tonight if you don't already know it. And if you don't know it, you're going to thank me for teaching it to you, Joe. All right, here we go. The guy comes into the shop. He says, Steve, my horn won't play in tune. I won't play in tune. The kid never plays in tune. Well, then I ask him, uh, tell me about this. Chuck White, I love you, Chuck. Uh, when you play your, just the mouthpiece, what pitch do you get? Well, I don't know. Well, why the hell don't you know? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I was about 45 uh, years old before I knew. And uh, Sandy Runyon uh, taught me uh, about this trick. And this is the best thing. Uh, Sandy taught me a lot of good things. But this is the best thing that Sandy Runyon ever taught me. And what it is, is that each saxophone mouthpiece, regardless of the brand, should have a different pitch. And if you're not producing that pitch, it is impossible for your saxophone to play in tune. Or you're going to have to do all kind of crazy adjusting and all that. And But you're not going to get good results until you learn how to get that good pitch. Now, here are the concert pitches. For your soprano, you want to get a C3. For your alto, an A2. For your tenor, a G2. And for the baritone, a D2. Now, if you need to adjust the pitch a little bit, now you ought to be able to hit that pitch <laughs> right on. But something we get our students to do is we make them learn to play scales etc. Uh, can't move the lip. Got to do it all with the throat. And uh, we get them to play little, little tunes and all that. Uh, so they learn how to interact with their throat onto the mouthpiece. Now, listen to me. This is a, a critical skill. And if you can't do it, that there's... And furthermore, there is no excuse for you not being able to play in tune if you're getting... A, a good good pitch, getting the right pitch on, on just your mouthpiece, okay? Uh, now, understand that old saxophones don't necessarily play in tune real well. Now, uh, 
Jason Mingledorf, the rock star, Jason's got a super four, Bush of super, uh, Bush of 400, top hat and cane. He sounds great on. He's got a 10M. He sounds great on. I think he's got a Chewberry. He sounds great on. But I want to tell you something. That man is a master player, and he used new. Okay. Tell you can play as good as Jason Mingledorf, uh, you're going you gonna to have to just learn how to hit this on top. Hey, Gerald, how you feeling tonight, buddy? All right. A couple of other things that's been... Uh, tried to do, uh, people have tried to do over the years. Con used to make saxophone with, with a tuner on the end, a micro tuner, and every click of the micro tuner was, you know, one cent or something. Are you kidding me? My dog's got sensitive ears. He can't tell the difference in one, you know, one cent in tuning and all that. I damn sure can't. Uh, but a micro tuner making those little bitty adjustments, are you kidding? Learn to play in tune with just your mouthpiece please. Uh, another thing I occasionally see a student doing, and then I slap some sense into them, is they're going to start to tune by pulling out the neck. Are you kidding me? Uh, that's the worst thing you can do. All right. Now, we know that when we're, and, and, and I consider myself a baritone player by profession, and particularly on the Barry, when you go from the middle finger C to the sixth finger in the octave key D, that you sound like you picked up a different horn a lot of times, unless you got a sax score May model baritone, because we fix that by changing the taper of the pigtail and all that. But here's the deal. It's been a problem as long as there's been uh, saxophones. And a couple of things that you can do Assuming, once again, that you're using a modern saxophone, if you're using an old horn, ain't, ain't, no, ain't no hope for you. But if if you're playing a modern saxophone, now you need to practice, okay? C, D, C, D. But you can change the octave pips. Uh, in, 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 and uh, the octave pip being this little guy right here, uh, you can... Change those, and here, let's get a good look at the world-famous Sax Romay logo. Um, and when you when you change those, you, the better pips are available. Um, another thing you can do if you don't want to replace the pip on, on the neck and the pip on the body, and you got to do them both at one time, is you can enlarge the existing pips. Now, on most tenors, if you'll enlarge the pip on the uh, neck, to a number 38 drill and the pip on the body to a number 42 drill, if they're smaller than that, which almost all of them are, uh, then it will uh, make a world of difference and change your life and you'll be happy. Okay, now let's talk about uh, that I hear people say all the time is, uh, is, is that, Steve, uh, my palm keys are too short, uh, too sharp. Well, sure they are. So, let's look at this on. If your saxophone is too sharp on the palm keys, then, then what you got to do is first make sure that it doesn't open. You know, you might drop that thing down to within about 30% yeah, of the diameter of the tone hole. I see horns all the time where they that thing open way up, you know. Okay, so pay close attention to the key heights here. Once again, remember that anything in excess of 30% of the diameter of the tone hole ain't going to make a damn better difference, so don't waste your time. But I see those all the time that are wrong. Now, if if the problem is the other way, where where the, the, the note, the palm key note and any other note on your saxophone are flat, what you got to do is move the effective center of the tone hole uh, further away from the mouthpiece, and, and we'll use we'll put a crescent in the top of the tone hole and just move it down, just a little, go a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Um, little, uh, too much is always better than not enough in a lot of things, except those tuning crescents. You have to be very careful, and you got to take the key on and off, on and off to get it done right, and. I don't recommend, some people use cork to do that, 
Uh, we use um, marine grade epoxy putty uh, because that stuff, uh, you, you can sand it down pretty and it's very easy to work with. And if you need to add another little, little fine layer on there and all that, it does really good. Okay, now another thing guys come in here whining about is Steve, I can't play the alto. Well, have you tried practicing? Did you get the Rasher book? Did you learn to play the bugle call on just a mouthpiece like uh, Mr. Rasher said to do? Okay, well, just to make sure we're doing right, on a lot of the altissimo fingerings, we're using our front F key, okay? Now, this palm key F here will open that much, but when I open, when I press the um, front F, it only opens that much, considerably less. Um, and you want to have that front F opening at most a quarter of an inch. Yeah. On all, of, and on the soprano, even less. Um, that when, when, when you press the uh, front F down, that it closes the B completely, or you ain't gonna get any of those notes out. It's supposed to do that. Okay, now let's talk about a couple of other problematic notes. And uh, one of them that people uh, piss and moan about all the time is about the uh, fourth line D. And the fourth line D is, if you think about it, how our octave key works is we got two vents on the saxophone. One of them's on the neck up here, and that one works from the notes A up through F sharp or, you know, whatever the ultimate range is. And then we got another vent here on the bottom. Let's see where we can get that where that guy opens. See that boy open and close? Yeah. Um, but the fourth line D, and that, that one controls the note from uh, A flat down to um, D. And, uh, of course, that means that the note D is at the extreme range of that pip, or what it's supposed to do. Now, in the perfect world, you'd have 12 pips on your saxophone, one for every semitone of the chromatic scale, but the most I've ever put on a horn was six, and it would stay in adjustment for about five minutes at a time. Then we'd have to work on it. Uh, we do currently manufacture a horn that has four, and I don't think anybody else does that. Um, but anyway, a couple of things you can, you can try. Finger your, your fourth line D, three fingers, three fingers, octave key, and add either the palm key D or add the palm key E flat. See how you like that. Uh, you might be surprised. That might change your whole world. Another thing you can do on that particular note is finger your six finger D, three on the top, three on the, on the bottom stack, add the octave key, and then open the low C sharp key. Now, you want to probably only open it about halfway because otherwise that uh, D is going to get mighty sharp on you. Another thing to do is uh, play that fourth line D, but don't use the octave key. Got to use a little bit of throat to get the right pitch, but that's okay. Uh, if you read sax on the web, they're going to tell you, well, you can fix that by adjusting the height of the low C key. Are you kidding me? Unless it's cranked way down, it ain't going to make a damn bit of difference. So just forget that. No, doesn't matter doesn't matter. Okay, another thing we run into on saxophones all the time is, yeah, I guess we might as well show you so you know. You look here. We got the low, the middle C. Uh, here, here's, here's third space C. And then also, here's third, here's third space C using a chromatic key on, on the, over here, over there. All right, now, let me tell you something. On, holy mackerel. Uh, on, on almost all saxophones, those two notes have entirely different sounds, and that's no good. So what you want to be sure and do is adjust the... the thank you for stopping by, Jason. You know I, I'm your biggest fan. Um, but what you, what you got to be sure and do is adjust the height 
of that chromatic key opening because almost invariably you can bring it down a little bit and bring that note in tune, but be sure you don't lose the voice on that. Um, and you may, it may get to be a situation where you have to use a tuning crescent to bring those two, you know, into synchronization. Now, if you're going to use the tuning crescent, you don't be able to do it on the C uh, with the middle finger because, that, well, there's cross venting, and I'm not going to explain that, but I'm going to tell you it ain't going to work. So what you're going to have to do is use the tuning crescent on the chromatic C tone hole. All right. Now, another thing people come in to see me about all the time is, Steve, I can't play my palm keys. I can't play my palm keys, Steve. I'm not worthy. Well, of course you're not worthy. But now, check this out. Now, I, I, I'm going to play my palm keys. But notice how much my hand has to move for the key opens. Yeah. It all right in there on top of it. Okay? But it's not on this one. Now, I've shown you on some previous seminars, my personal tenor. People say, hey, you got the risers on there so high. How can you ever play it? Hell, I play it real fine. Thank you very much. But it's just like getting a suit tailored, you know? Those palm keys ought to be high enough. And people say, well, why don't you just get your account work? Because they got those nice adjustable uh, palm key risers. Well, they do have, a, uh, I think those are available still at extra cost. But anyway, the, the problem is, the way my hand interacts with this, the, the palm key spatula, and that's what you call them, spatulas, is at an angle, right? See, I get in there like that. But on the cow work, the way their mechanism works, the palm key riser is straight. Well, that's not natural. Okay, so yeah, you can adjust them for height, but no, uh, it only works for Martians or something like that. Um, now, one of the solutions that I find for a lot of players' uh, issues is that the uh, on, on the low C... <coughs> to reach down there to that low C key, what ends up happening is you have to stretch and you lock the digit here, our little finger. Well, nobody can play like that. You ought to play nice and relaxed with a natural curvature of your fingers. Right, Donna Schwartz? All right, so what you gotta do is you gotta bring the height of that low C up. So we'll put a, a wedge-shaped riser on that so you can reach it easily with your little pinky finger. And on top of that, same thing applies to the low B. And on the low B flat, we do the same thing. We, we get it where we got that natural curvature of the hand. Everybody's relaxed. And, and, and we do that. So, you know, put a wedge-shaped riser and on my different websites and uh, groups on Facebook, you can see some of the risers we built. Everyone's custom job. We also typically put a riser, but uh, also on the G sharp key touch. Because you know, I see I see guys all the time. If this was the key touch, they got their finger done there like that. You know, are you kidding me? It ought to be nice and relaxed. Play on the tips. Play on the tips. And uh, sometimes the customer. Uh, may need a little extra help on the low B, low C sharp. Um, so all those can have risers and on the octave key. So you don't have to have so much movement. Um, now, one last thing I want to cover in, in the, you know, is it me or is it the horn? Is people ask, uh, Steve, could you just move the key touches? Because <coughs> I played some of your horn. See, we, we use on our curved soprano, on the saxophone make curved soprano, the key spacing for the main stacks is the same as on our alto. On our barry, the uh, key spacing is the same as on our tenor. Uh, it shouldn't hurt to, to play saxophone. So, at any rate, one of the things we uh, can do on a baritone, it's pretty easy to move those key touches in a little bit on, on other baritones besides a uh, saxophone way. Um, on the other horns, altos, tenors, you can move them, 
but you're going to destroy the finish because those uh, pearl holders are all hard soldered onto the keys. So I apologize once again for the crappy internet connection that we've had tonight. I don't know why that is, but we have. So uh, anyway, maybe we'll have better luck next time. So if you have any questions, you can call me during office hours. My phone number is on the uh, nationofmusic.com uh, site and uh, the, as well as the office hours. And, uh, or you can email me or you can, uh, we've got a place on nationofmusic.com that's Ask Steve. If you have any questions about saxophone design, construction, maintenance, any of that technical stuff, I'd be glad to help you uh, when I can. Uh, if you call me and I don't answer, that means I'm busy or I'm with a client or such as that. So I never check voicemail. So just call me again, okay? Because I'm, gl I'm glad to help uh, help anybody. Uh, I thank you all very, very much for watching. Uh, we had a super successful uh, Black Friday Cyber Monday event, and I, I, I thank all of you for making that possible. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, once again, Tyler, Alex, Jack, I'm sorry things just didn't work out for you, but they didn't. So, you guys be sure and tune in to my good buddy Donna Schwartz's uh, uh, seminar. It's going to be going on at uh, 6 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, Donna's going to answer questions tonight, uh, and she's a master teacher. She knows what she's doing. Uh, Y'all listen to what she has to say. So, from Saxe World Headquarters, I'm down in the Command and Control Bunker, which is located in Sector R, the birthplace of jazz. Listen, uh, I, I'll, Keith will talk about that another time. Just call me sometime. Uh, anyway, practice long tones every day. And remember, keep your reed wet. Goodbye for now. I've enjoyed it.